بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله سبحانه وتعالى he says in the Quran speaking directly to our master Muhammad صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم وما ارسلناك الا رحمة للعالمين we did not send we did not send you except as a mercy to all the worlds that the greatest manifestation uh, of the compassion the rahma of the indiscriminately compassionate ar rahman is our master muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam the prophet peace be upon him he said in a hadith and there is some weakness in the hadith but the ulama consider it sound in its meaning he said adabni rabbi fa ahsana ta'dibi that my Lord has disciplined or trained, educated me. My Lord taught me adab and how great, how beautiful is my adab. So the Prophet's tarbiyah, his education, if you will, is rabbaniyah, is lordly. So just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most compassionate and the most forgiving, he has trained and disciplined and commanded his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, to be a paragon of compassion and forgiveness, to reflect those divine names at the level of a human being. Thus, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the Abdullah par excellence. He is the perfect servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى That he is a uniquely sanctified human agent of the divine sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam compassion and forgiveness are core virtues in the broader uh, what's known as the in the west as the abrahamic tradition it is uh, it is reported that dawud alaihi salam he said in the psalms uh, in the hebrew language he said tov adonai lekol the lord is good to all and that his mercy is over all of his works, his mercy is over all of his actions. Or to put it Quranically, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that my mercy encompasses everything. In Matthew chapter 9, Isa alayhi salam is reported to have said, speaking to the Pharisees, he says, go and learn what this text means. And then he actually quotes from the written Torah. So he quotes from the Torah. And this is something that we find quite often in the New Testament. It's interesting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that Isa alayhi salam said, Musaddiqa lima bayna yadaya mina Torah, that he confirms the Torah. So he said, Ki chesed chafatsti velo zivach, but da'at Elohim me'oloth. Quoting the Torah in Hebrew, I require mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And this is a very interesting statement that's attributed to Isa alayhi salam. Whether he said it or not, Allahu, Allah, Allahu alam. But it's very interesting because according to Christians, according at least to Trinitarian Christians, God himself sacrificed himself for our sins. This is not the teaching of Isa alayhi salam. This is not the teaching of Jesus, peace be upon him, even according to Matthew's gospel. In Matthew's gospel, he says, I require mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. God requires mercy. And he inscribed mercy upon his own nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kataba rabbukum ala nafsihi rahma, that your Lord has inscribed mercy upon his own self. And of course, the Prophet sallallahu as we said, is that beautiful reflection of the divine attributes at the level of a human being, a sanctified human agent. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Ana nabiyur rahma. I am the Prophet of mercy. I am the Prophet of compassion. He said, Ana uh, rahmatun muhda. I am a gifted mercy. He said, Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamkum man fil sama. He said, show compassion and mercy to those on earth and the one in heaven in no anthropomorphic sense will show you mercy. Now, with respect to forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
in the Hadith Qudsi, which is related by Imam At-Tirmidhi. He said, Ya ibn Adam, O child of Adam, innaka ma da'awtani wa rajawtani ghafartu lak ala ma kana mink wa la ubali. He said that, O oh, ch oh, child of Adam, as long as you call upon me and you have hope in me, I will forgive you and I don't mind. Wala ubali. And I don't mind forgiving you. In a hadith that's related by Ibn Habban, we're told that the Prophet وسلم, on the day of Uhud, while blood was streaming down his face, وسلم, he sustained injuries inflicted upon him by his enemies on that day. The Sahaba saw him with his hands raised to the heavens and he said, Allahumma ighfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive them, forgive my people, for they don't know what they're doing. This is the Prophet wasallam. There's something similar to this attributed to Isa wasallam. The New Testament tells us that Isa wasallam forgave his enemies. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This verse, which is in Luke chapter 23, verse uh, 34 is now re universally recognized as a fabrication to the text of the Gospel of Luke by New Testament textual critics. Yet our Prophet وسلم, when he came into Mecca during the conquest of Mecca, and he's now in a position of power, he's in a position where he can punish the entire city. What did he say, وسلم? He said, La tathriba alaykum al yom. This shows the magnanimous character of the Prophet ﷺ. He quoted Yusuf ﷺ according to the Qur'an. This day there is no blemish upon you. Yaghfirullahu lakum. Allah has forgiven you. In a hadith that's related by Imam al nawawi in the Riyadh al-Salihin, we're told that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ after the prayer. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have committed a sin. I have, I have transgressed the bounds of permissibility according to the book of God. So, so punish me according to the book of God. And the, and the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and, say, and said, Hal ma salah? Didn't you just pray with us? Didn't you just pray with us? And the man said, Naam, he said, yes. And the Prophet said, Ghad lak. It has already been forgiven for you. It has already been forgiven. This reminds me of something else that the Christians attribute to Isa alayhi salam in John chapter 8, what's known as the pericope adulteri. We are told, and this is mentioned in every single Jesus movie that you might have seen. This scene is indispensable. They have to put it in every movie. This is when a woman was caught in the act of adultery and she's being chased around by these Pharisees and she finds Jesus and she collapses at his feet. And then he says the famous statement, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. Uh, this story in John chapter 8 is also universally recognized as a fabrication to the Gospel of John. Very, very interesting. So we have these, we have these traditions. This is something that uh, is, is interesting because oftentimes when we think of compassion and mercy, we think about Christianity, and obviously compassion and mercy are great virtues in that religion. We think of the Bible, and obviously in the New Testament, compassion and mercy are great virtues. But this is something that is found in our tradition in spades. If we would just look at our tradition and the, and the common perception is that Islam is all about uh, retribution and fire and brimstone and this type of thing. But we have to look deeply into our, into our tradition. So the point is that the Prophet وسلم, he prioritized compassion and forgiveness over justice. Justice is a great virtue, right? Don't get me wrong, it is the basis of our sharia ah, according to Imam al-Qurtubi. Without justice, uh, we wouldn't have social well-being. <clears throat> we couldn't have peaceful coexistence. But the Prophet ﷺ, he prioritized compassion and forgiveness over justice. Now, none of us have compassion and forgiveness in an absolute sense, absolute and perfect sense. That is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's the same when it comes to justice. It's the same when it comes to justice. So absolute and perfect justice cannot manifest in this world. This is our belief. And I hate to burst uh, your bubbles. It's just, it's just not going to happen. It is not the nature of the dunya to produce absolute and perfect justice. And to obsess in its pursuance is an exercise in futility. Of course, we have to do our best to be just in this world. According to our principles, 
We have to do our best, but ultimately we will fall short of perfection. And we have to recognize this. Earthly systems, human interpretations will never be perfect. You see, we are not meant to be too comfortable in the dunya. And this is the secret to understanding what it means to be in the world and not of the world. Or as the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib, o abiru sabilin, be in the dunya, be in the world, like a stranger or one who's passing by. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only al adil can be absolutely just. The state or some polity cannot replicate or replace Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to think that it can is, is beyond terrifying and really intimates a crisis of faith. And they've tried this in the past. It's called Maoism. It's called Stalinism. It's called fascism. This is why we believe in something called Yawm al-Qiyamah. Yawm al-Qiyamah, Yawm al-Din, the day of judgment, Yawm al-Hisab, the day of accounting, Yawm Azim, Yawm Ayakumu Nasu Rabbil Alameen. This is a day on which human beings will stand before the Lord of the worlds. And guess what? On that day, on that Yawm Azim, we won't want justice. We will want compassion. And it is our hope in Allah's compassion that gives us peace. It is our hope in Allah's compassion that gives us peace. No compassion, no peace. No one on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah is going to be saying, no justice, no peace. No compassion, no peace. That is the sentiment on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. When I say peace here, I'm talking about a true peace, a lasting peace. This is our hope. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, indeed, indeed, you have in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa a beautiful pattern of conduct, a paragon of virtue. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخَرُ وَذَّكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا For whoever has raja, who has hope, who has hope in Allah and hope in the final day and makes remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in great abundance. In college, you may have studied someone, philosopher named Friedrich Nietzsche, who said that compassion was actually a vice and an indication of a slur of a slave or herd mentality. And he advocates for what he calls a transvaluation of all values, essentially rethinking all values. And when, he, when he's talking about values, he means Christian values. And those are values that we as Muslims oftentimes share with Christians. And people say, well, Nietzsche was a visionary and he saw or he predicted this type of nihilism that would come out from this, what he called the death of God in the future. And he was a, a, a bit of a visionary. I will admit that. But how ironic is it that this man's final sane act before completely losing his mind. He was walking in the streets of Turin, Italy, and he saw a man beating his horse, and he ran and he embraced the horse and he was crying, and that's his final saint act. He never even spoke again. His final saint act on this earth was an act of compassion. Very, very interesting. How ironic. Now, what we cannot do is align ourselves with certain people who represent certain groups who are fundamentally opposed to our non-negotiable metaphysical and moral commitments. And various Muslims do this for a variety of reasons. Probably the biggest reason is this shared perception of victimization, what's known as uh, intersectionality in the academy. Or it's out of this need to assimilate with postmodern quote unquote progressivism in the academy, really due to a lack of knowledge uh, of one's uh, uh, of one's own tradition or a lack of confidence in one's own tradition. So some of us we align ourselves with certain people who maintain very very antithetical positions to our tradition. People who say things like. All traditional value systems are inherently oppressive. That the Judeo-Christian Judeo Islamic tradition uh, is inherently oppressive. People who have declared essentially ideological warfare 
on the tradition of Ibrahim alayhi salam, on Abrahamic religions, on Abrahamic morality. These are people who believe that there is no such thing as objective truth, which is in and of itself a contradiction. These are people who believe that, that there's nothing normative. They don't like that word normative. Why is this a problem? Because eventually they will expect us to compromise our morals, our ethics, our theological beliefs, the very ethos of our religion, in the hopes of mutually conjuring up, by any means necessary, some sort of radically egalitarian and quote-unquote just utopia on earth according to their subjective definitions of justice, morality, right, and wrong. You see, the Prophet وسلم, he said, there will come a time when nothing will remain of this religion. La yabqa minal islam illa isma, except its name. It's going to become uh, a name without a reality. This hadith indicates that there is a normative definition of Islam. It is not defined by our feelings. It is not defined by the zeitgeist, the, the sort of spirit of the current age. You see, in the pre-modern world, the truth, how does one know the haq, the truth? The truth was taken from naql and aql. It was taken from revelation and reason. Revelation and reason working together, what the Quran calls nur, nurun ala nur, light upon light. Now, I'm not romanticizing the pre-modern world. I'm not talking about the pre-modern world on the level of society or, or politics. I'm talking about the pre-modern world on the level of epistemology, on the epistemic level. How does one know the truth? It was taken from naql and aql, and that's true. That's right. They got that right. And then we move into the modern world and naql, revelation, is completely thrown out of the window. Everything becomes aql or everything becomes a strict, rigid type of empiricism that if you can't see or taste or touch or see something or, 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 or smell something, then it doesn't exist. So we've entered into a state of, of total materialism, mechanistic science, Newtonian physics, completely disregarding the metaphysical and the spiritual. This is the epistemology of the modern world, but now we've even moved beyond that into the postmodern world, where knuckle and uckle, both of them are thrown out of the window. You can't trust your intellect. They say there's no objective truth. So how does one arrive at truth? What is the epistemology of the postmodern world? It's based on your feelings. Whatever you want reality to be, it's your truth now. Lowercase t, your truth. There's no such thing as al haq anymore. There's no such thing as the truth anymore. It's all your truth. And now reality is simply defined by the, by the current zeitgeist. No matter how antithetical it might be to the authentic teachings of our Prophet But as Muslims, we have certain uh, theological and ethical thawabit these are immutables. These are non-negotiables. These are underlying principles that we cannot give up. Islam is defined by Allah and his messenger. Uh, Islam is defined by Allah and his messenger. It is not defined by our feelings. The Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he could have made us one people, all like-minded, but he didn't do that. So we need to be principled. And not sell out, right? The Prophet وسلم, he said to one of his companions, Speak the truth, even if it's bitter. And don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid of the people who reproach you for your religion. Morality is not subjective. Truth is real. And falsehood is real. And this is our deen. We should stick up for it. And if people disagree with us, then just say, Lakum dina kum waliyadeen. Quote the Quran to them. What's more tolerant than that? You have your religion, I have my religion. You have your epistemology, I have my epistemology. You're ha you have your so called truths, and I have, I have my truth. You have your ways of, of, of living, your way of life, whatever you want to do, I have my way of living. Don't tell me what to say or do. I won't tell you what to say or do. The Quran says, Faman sha'af al yu'min. Whoever wishes, let him believe. Whoever wants to, let him believe. 
And whoever doesn't want to believe, let him disbelieve. I used to tell my Christian students, I used to teach at a, a, a uh, predominantly Catholic college. And many of my students who were Catholic, they would get berated by some of their professors who would spout this postmodern philosophy. And they would come to my office hour and I would tell them, I would tell them, believe in God, persevere in God. Don't sell out. Don't be afraid. I would quote to them their own scripture. Isa salam, he said to the disciples, if they hate you, remember they hated me first. You see, the people of dunya, the geocentric people, I'm not talking about scientific geocentrism. I'm talking about people who are morally geocentric, people who put the world at the center of their lives, put dunya in the center of their lives, or egocentric people, people who put ana, people who put the ego in the center of their lives. These people tend to hate and insult and ridicule the theocentric people, the people who put theos, who put Allah in the center of their lives. This is the dunya. Welcome to the dunya. So if this is our position, if we take our stand and we stand firm, then you will notice that decent non-Muslim people, especially people who fear and love God, who practice traditional morality, people who understand the power of compassion and forgiveness, and are not constantly screaming, justice, 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 they will respect our differences. They will advocate for peaceful coexistence, and they will agree to disagree. But with these postmodern types, these moral relativists, these critical theorists, these nominalists, the philosophical materialists, the social constructionists, when it comes to them, they will never agree to disagree with us. What you will eventually hear from them, if they do agree, it's for a short term. But eventually what you'll hear from them is, if you don't agree with me, and if you don't radically reform your archaic religious beliefs and opinions, then you are a racist and you're a bigot and you're a transphobe and you're a homophobe. You might be a fat phobe. You're a misogynist. You're a caveman. And you're just a purveyor of toxic patriarchy. And you know what? There's no room for you anymore in our little earthly utopia. And my response to that is, that's fine. Hasbun Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient for us all by himself. Don't sell out. It's not worth it. Have istiqama. Life is too short to be a sellout. It's going to be over soon. Stick to your principles. Have istiqama. Have uprightness in the religion. The man came to the Prophet وسلم, and said, Ya Rasulullah, قُلْ لِي فِي الْإِسْلَامِ قَوْلًا لَا أَسْأَلُ أَنْهُ أَحَدًا غَيْرَكَ Tell me something about Islam that only you can tell me. Tell me something precious and unique. The Prophet said, قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ Say, I believe in Allah. ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ And be upright and steadfast upon that. Don't be wishy-washy. Seek a place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not a place in the hearts of human beings. We know that the Prophet وسلم, is the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Habibullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him in the Quran, If you were to follow their vain desires, if you were to follow their vain desires, even you, if you were to follow their vain desires, even after knowledge, now that knowledge has come to you, then you will find neither helper nor protector against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, we have this axiom in, in uh, Islamic exegesis, that the salient point is taken, uh, is the, the salient point is due to the generality of the wording, not due to the specificity of its occasion of revelation. In other words, this ayah also applies to all of us that if we were to follow their vain desires, now that after knowledge of the truth has reached us, then we would find neither helper nor protector against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing, to paraphrase a very brilliant man, if we're going to uh, constantly complain about things uh, and uh, complain about others and complain about how bad we've got it, 
We better make sure that the evil is truly out there, is truly outside of ourselves and not in our own hearts. The Prophet وسلم, he said, Whenever you want to mention the faults of others, first remember your own faults. He said, Man Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever exalts himself will be debased and humiliated. This is totally lost on a lot of modern people. Be humble. Be grateful. Inequality does not always mean inequity. Just because there is inequality in the world, which, by the way, is the nature of the world. The world is high and low. It's ebb and flow. That doesn't mean that there are always victims of that inequality. It doesn't always denote that there's injustice. There are some people who are more intelligent than others. There are some people who have more wealth than others. There are some people who are better looking than others. That's the nature of the world. Now, there are victims in the world. That's true. Obviously, there are victims of oppression and injustice. But what we tend to do is self-victimize. Right? We feel like someone owes us something. And the cure for that is really self-criticism and gratitude. Shukr. This is a big theological virtue that's mentioned many, many places in the Quran. In Semitic rhetoric, there's something called binarity. Binarity. You find this in the Quran. This is when antithetical ideas or concepts are juxtaposed in a text. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Remember me or have regard for me so that I might have regard for you. Um, be grateful to me and do not disbelieve. Be grateful, have shukur, and do not enter into, into a state of kufur. Very interesting. These two ideas are juxtaposed. Shukur and kufur are juxtaposed. What does that mean? That means they're antonyms. They're opposites. In other words, Ingratitude is a type of kufr. Ingratitude and kufr are synonymous then, that the word for ingratitude in the Quran is kufr. So we have to be very, very careful. There was a certain king who had it all except gratitude. So he was discontent. One of my teachers told this, this parable. He said this certain king, he had it all, but he didn't have gratitude. And he would go on walks outside of his uh, outside of his castle, in the woods, outside of his castle. And he noticed a pauper, a very poor man, next to a tree. And this poor man, he had a glass of water, he had some a little crust of bread, barely any clothes to cover his aura. But this pauper, this poor man, he was singing the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the king approached him and said, why are you so happy you have nothing? And the man said, why shouldn't I be? I have it all. I have water, I have some food, I have clothes that cover my aura. I have blue skies, the birds are chirping, I have my health. I have the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spinning in my heart and in my tongue. Why shouldn't I be happy? And this man was an arif billah, this pauper, and he recognized the king. He said, why are you so unhappy? You're the king. And the king said, I don't know, I have it all, but I'm unhappy. So the pauper said to the king, if you were stranded in the desert and you were going to die of thirst, how much of your kingdom would you give for a half a glass of water? How much of your kingdom would you give for half a glass of water? And the king said, half of my kingdom I would give. And the man said to him, if you drank that water and you could not excrete it out of your body and it was going to cause an infection and kill you, how much of your kingdom would you give to get rid of that glass of water from your body? He said, the other half of my kingdom. So the pauper said, your entire kingdom is worth a glass of water. I have that here. I also have some bread. I have blue skies. I have clothes that cover my aura. I have the birds chirping. I have my health. And I have the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my heart and spitting on my tongue. What more can I want? This parable is obviously meant to be hyperbolic, but you get the point. Just be grateful. Be content. Be in a state of taslim to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because continuous ingratitude and an obsession for earthly justice is upstream to discontentment with Allah's qadr, and that is dangerous. A lot of our young students in high school and 
in, in college. They want to change the world, and that's good. We should want to be idealistic to change the world. But they get involved in these radical causes. I tell them, relax, calm down. You're not Aquaman. You're not Wonder Woman. You're not in the Justice League. Nietzsche's Ubermensch, or Superman, is motivated by a love of this world and a rejection of the next. While the Prophet Wasallam, the true Superman, he said, love of the world or attachment to the world, to the ephemeral, to this, to this world that's going to pass away into nothing. Love of the world is the head of every sin, is the head of every sin. We just need to do our best and say, Alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. Praise be, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every state. And we should have shukr because we know that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, is khayr al-khalqillah. He is Sayyidu Waladi Adam. He is the master of the children of Adam. That fact by itself should, should engender within our hearts an extreme manifestation of shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point where we really don't have much to complain about. Especially us living in the West, what are we complaining about? Think about it. I can't even go to an interfaith dialogue anymore. I used to do these. I've done these for 20 years. I can't go anymore. Now they've just become exhibitions of ingratitude. They've become these pity parties where no real knowledge is communicated. It's just anecdotal evidence. I remember a time at interfaith dialogues. We used to actually talk about Allah and his messenger. Now it's a bunch of people complaining. Oh, I was 20 years ago, I was in a grocery store and somebody made some racist comment to me in a grocery store. Okay, that's, that's horrible. You know, racism is an evil thing. But is that really what we're talking about now in interfaith dialogues? What do you expect from the world? You know, the Prophet وسلم, in Medina, this is his own city. He's the head of state. People said worse to him to his own face in Medina. Why do we expect America in 2020 or in 2010, whatever, to be better than Medina? The Prophet وسلم, was walking in Medina with his wife. And a group of people walked by him and said, Assalamu alaikum, may death be upon you. This is, this is a tahdeed. This is a threat. They're threatening his life. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why do we expect our conditions to be better? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not pity his prophet. He gave him words of consolation. There's a difference. He gave him suwar or chapters of the Quran of tasliya to strengthen him, to encourage him. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, was kicked out of the city of Ta'if, stoned out of the city and collapsed under the tree, he said, Allahumma uh, ashku ilayka da'fa quwwati. I complain to you, O oh God, of my weakness of strength. He didn't complain to Allah, look, what, what did you do? Why did you do this to me? I complain about these people. What did he say? I complain of my weakness of my strength. He complained about his own weakness. This is the Prophet Sallallahu We complain so much. We have to think about this because Allah certainly gave us all the reason to complain now. Look at us now. But even now, even now, don't complain because you know it could be a thousand times worse. It could be a thousand times worse. Just look inward, repent, and correct your conduct. The Prophet Sallallahu was a victim of verbal and physical abuse in Mecca. But how did he handle that situation? Now some of the, and I'll end with this, some of the ulama, they divide the Prophet's life in terms of Isawi and Musawi periods, Christic and Mosaic periods. In other words, when the Prophet ﷺ was living in Mecca, he resembled Isa ﷺ. When he was living in Medina, he resembled Musa ﷺ. Right? Mecca and Medina. In Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ, he practiced something called assertive nonviolence. Martin Luther King said that Isa ﷺ practiced assertive nonviolence. What is assertive nonviolence? This should be our practice. It is to be totally nonviolent, totally nonviolent, yet principled, virtuous, and devout. To have istiqamah in the deen, to follow our, our kitab, our revelation, to follow our messenger, 
Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, unapologetically, but shunned violence. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he went out for da'wah and they threw garbage on him, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, O oh, you wrapped in a mantle, Qum fa'anzir, get on your feet, get up and go warn the people you have a job to do. What is Allah telling the Prophet here essentially? Essentially, continue to be compassionate to them in the face of their abuse to you. Because a Prophet is a nadir, he's a warner. When someone warns you about something, that's a manifestation of compassion. Allah tells them, get up and go back out there and show them compassion. وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ And magnify your Lord. Stay positive. You have a Rabb. The Rabb denotes the imminent deity. The Rabb is the one who takes care of you. Right? The God who loves you and takes care of you. Trust Him. وَثِيَابَكَ فَتَهِرْ And keep your clothes clean. Right? They did it to you. They threw this garbage on you. But you are going to clean it up. Right? Take care of yourself. Don't victimize yourself. Pick yourself up. Dust yourself off. Go back out there and show them compassion. This is very, very difficult because we want to stay down with dirt on us and say, you pick me up. You put me here, you have to pick me up. I'm not going anywhere unless you pick me up. You did this. I'm the victim. Get up. And shun their idolatry, their immorality. Be principled. Don't be a sellout. وَلَا تَمْنُونْ تَسْتَكْفِرْ وَلِرَبِّكَ فَاسْبِرْ And don't think, that, don't think that they owe you anything. They don't owe you anything. And be hopeful. Be optimistic. Don't be rash or impetuous. Be patient on your Lord. Inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase all of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us all in knowledge and in patience uh, and in shukr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the shakirin. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidi Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.